Now that it's 3.03 and all the tech seems to be working, we'll go ahead and get started because we have quite a bit that we want to cover. So um, our intros are coming a couple minutes into the presentation. So hold on, we will introduce ourselves. Uh, we're going to go over the agenda and goals of the session first. So again, you've joined Maintaining Autonomy and Privacy Online in a Culture of Surveillance. So hopefully you're in the right place. Um, our goals today are to learn about existing forms of digital surveillance that activists and nonprofits face, to fill your toolbox with ideas for protecting yourself from surveillance, uh, and we're going to have an emphasis on the types and benefits of encryption. Um, we're going to talk about our approach. That's where we're going to introduce ourselves. We'll do a quick understanding the internet in five minutes. We'll talk about surveillance um, and the threat that it is. And then we'll talk about defeating surveillance with a focus on encryption. So our approach. Um, we do not believe that you have to be a superhero or a tech wizard in order to understand what we're talking about or be um, a tech person or someone interested in technology. These are fake ideas that are meant to gatekeep technology and knowledge. Um, neither of us have a tech background, but we are technologists. So I'm Amanda. Um, I work with an organization called the Digital Defense Fund that provides uh, digital security support to nonprofits in the abortion access movement. Um, I have a background in public policy. I was a case manager at a small nonprofit where I helped young people get access to abortion. Uh, and I started using tech because I wanted to start a text hotline to better reach young people who were seeking our services. Um, and all of the commercial text hotline options that I could find were ridiculously expensive. And so the person who is now my boss helped me kind of hack together a text hotline using a few different really affordable services. And I was hooked. Um, and I'll let Rachel introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. I'm Rachel Lorenzo. Um, I'm from the Pueblo of Laguna, which is one of 19 uh, Pueblo tribes here in New Mexico. I'm also Mescalero Apache, which is um, in southeastern New Mexico, and Chicana. Um, I use they them pronouns. I am one of the co-founders of Indigenous Women Rising, and I manage our abortion access, or I'm sorry, our abortion fund, so uh, I'm the abortion access lead. Um, my background is in community organizing um, and in politics. Uh, I volunteered for campaigns and um, I never really saw indigenous people in tech or IT. Um, and I really just found it interesting. And um, interestingly enough, it was through DDF, um, through a workshop a few years ago and I was hooked and um, I started realizing, hey, indigenous people are among the most surveilled and I should really know as much as I can about it. Um, and I love makeup so much. Um, so I started just researching tech and cybersecurity and then I created a, an Instagram account where all I do is talk about tech and cybersecurity while I put on my makeup. Uh, and some of my favorite folks to follow um, one of them is Kate, um, who's the ED at DDF, and then the hashtag data feminism. So one of our board members, um, Catherine Dignazio, is one of our board members and a professor at MIT. And so um, the book that she co-authored, Data Feminism, actually goes to support Indigenous women raising, and it's a really great thread, and I've met some great people there. Uh -huh. We also wanted to highlight some of the intersectional challenges of digital security that we see because we come to this kind of from a non-traditional tech background, um, starting with the fact that when access to technology is a privilege, talking about digital security can be a hard conversation or can even feel irrelevant for people. Um, so Rachel shared this example with me while we were preparing this. Um, yeah, um, so... I grew up on a reservation. Um, uh, the, cell so the cell phone service isn't very good and a lot of low-income folks don't have access to credit or the great, have the greatest credit. 
And so buying a prepaid phone that might only have a few gigs of RAM and doesn't have the most up-to-date operating system might have a harder time staying safe um, when they're using uh, a prepaid cell phone um, that might not have all of the latest security patches. Um, but um, there are still things that we can do to stay safe. Um. All right. Donors and two supporters. That is scheduled for today, 4 p.m. EDT. Oh. I will hop in there. I can't, I can't mute people. Our host, room hosts, I think you need to mute Oh, yourself. gosh, I can't do that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we also think we're all experts in our own experiences. I can send you the link to that one, Chad. Oh. that help you? Uh, sure. So, uh, our, our room host, you're still not muted. Yeah, I didn't see it on the where should I email you? What what accounts do you have open? This is just on the on the app agenda. Uh, okay. Uh, you can send it to any of the. No, I've got help or activism. Um. Well. All right. Sending it to help. Um. Donor panel link sent to your thing. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry, folks. My mute was done. <laughs> I've caught that now. Carry on. Okay. <laughs> um. Yeah, we're, we're all experts in our own experiences. Um, there's also lots of things that it's impossible to be an expert in, like the pronunciation of GIF. I say GIF. <laughs> I switch between the two. I have no loyalty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if anyone has strong feelings they want to share in the chat, uh, feel free. Yeah, even at a digital organizing conference, always, always digital uh, ups and downs. Um, We're learning so, together. Yes. <laughs> we also just wanted to preface by saying there's no silver bullet solution. Unfortunately, we won't be able to like say this is how we solve the problems with surveillance on the internet. Uh, but we can all cultivate practices to help protect ourselves. Uh, so I, I, something that really helped me when I was starting to understand digital security was like gaining a deeper understanding of the internet and how it works. Uh, so I wanted to share some kind of a brief overview of that. Um, one thing that really surprised me as I was learning more about the internet is really understanding that it's not like up there somewhere. It's actually cables and computers um, and a lot of subterranean cables that go all the way across the ocean. Uh, so this is a great GIF that's just a reminder that sharks can eat the internet. Um, and as I learned more about these cables, I've also learned about how connected they are, like their routes exist because of colonialism and routes based on colonialism. So the internet's history is also very intersectional and tied up in oppression. Yeah, just thinking about um, cell phone towers too, about where cell phone towers are located and the land, who used to steward those lands and how um, communications companies got permission to build those cell towers. Yeah, yeah, which brings us to the point that the, the internet is a bunch of computers talking to other computers, and those computers are mostly owned by companies, um, as Rachel just highlighted. So these, these are some of the computers that your computer talks to when you're accessing the internet. Um, you might either talk to a Wi-Fi router or a cell phone tower. Uh, releasing data signals. Um, you'll talk to a domain name server, which is the computer that translates the website from like google.com to numbers um, called IP addresses. And that's how the internet locates things. Um, whereas we use like the word google.com. Uh, and that's owned by your internet service provider, which is what ISP stands for. Um, that will go to a server owned by the internet service provider. And then another server, servers are just big computers. We'll go to another server owned by Google, and then you'll see Google. So all of these computers are behind the scenes when you're surfing the internet. And there's a lot of actors along the way that can try to access your information. So you're this little person. Um, this comic is from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is one of our other favorite follows for information. Um, so someone owns the Wi-Fi router that you're using. Uh, and then there's a variety of actors, whether authorized or not, that can get your information as it goes to the internet service provider and beyond. So the systems administrator could be 
you know, the IT person at the business where you're using Wi-Fi. It could be someone who works for your internet service provider, um, someone who works for the website you're going to, and they generally are authorized to have access to everything you're doing um, while you're connected. Um, hackers obviously are unauthorized, but do have ways of getting access. And then there's also the police, um, law enforcement agencies, um, surveillance agencies, and law lawyers who can use legal tools, um, sometimes authorized, sometimes questionably authorized to access information either from your device itself, from the Wi-Fi router, from your internet service provider, or from the website you're visiting. So there's lots of people along this path of computers that make up the internet that want our information. So now we'll talk about what surveillance is and who is surveilling us. Um, so why do we care about surveillance? Um, basically, the online surveillance right now, it's collecting so much data that it's building an enormous haystack full of needles that are very easy to find. It's like a haystack that's a sortable database um, and everything that we do is in it. Even if you aren't doing anything wrong, like surveillance alters people's state of mind, like when you're driving and you see a, a police car. Um, that definitely kind of affects me, like physically, <laughs> when I see a police car when I'm driving. Um, and one of the huge issues with these digital haystacks that are being created is that the algorithms that are being used to sort through them are racist and transphobic um, and extremely biased. Rachel, I'll let you cover this slide. Yeah. So um, this, uh, the Coded Bias film um, essentially is a black um, computer scientist who, um, Joy, who um, saw that there was um, biases on like who uh, artificial technology could identify and who are the people who are creating um, the algorithms that are going to be able to identify different aspects of our face. It's usually white men, right? And um, just thinking about how, you know, when we're just walking down the street or we're going into a store and we see like a camera and the surveillance, um, not knowing what kind of technology is behind that camera. Um, and also understanding that a lot of artificial technology that does any kind of like facial recognition um, is very likely to be um, biased and, and inaccurate. And the people who are getting the most surveilled are black people. And so in this example, Joy's face wasn't even recognized. And so it wasn't until she put up a, a white mask to her face that, it, that the technology detected something. Um, and that's a really huge issue because we know that there are law enforcement agencies who are using this kind of technology to identify people. Um, and we don't, um, to an extent, representation is important um, to, to be able to create something that um, is more representative of us, but isn't harmful um, to where law enforcement is targeting over surveilling certain groups of people. Yeah, just recently there was the first known case of a police department using facial recognition and falsely identifying someone and arresting the wrong person because um, the algorithm said that this it was a black man and it said that he was the same as another black man and he wasn't. <laughs> um, so it, the same biases that we see from um, you know, the witness lineups are being replicated in this same, in this technology. Um, this is a great comic if you have anyone in your life who's like, ah, eh, whatever, I'm not doing anything wrong. Uh, that really explains the concepts we were just talking about that um, maybe if you're someone who a lot of this technology was created for, or who law enforcement was founded to, um, if they were founded to protect your property, you might not, um, feel the threats from these from the lack of privacy as much as someone else um, but for people who privacy and surveillance do affect um, it's really important um, and we know that surveillance techniques are also tested on already oppressed communities 
a lot of these technologies are tested on the border. Um, one example of this is automatic license plate readers, which um, were originally developed for border crossings. Uh, and then now every police department in the United States pretty much uses automatic license plate readers. So once it's uh, perfected on, you know, this target audience on the border, it's then turned over um, to use on everyone. And even private, you know, homeowners associations can buy automatic license plate technology now to track who's going in and out of their neighborhood. And just to give an example of how um, mass surveillance is, um, like it's such a huge um, part of today's governance is uh, in my day job, I work for state government and um, there, it's publicly available so you can, anyone can search for it, but there was a programmatic agreement between a few different tribes outside of New Mexico CBP or the Customs and um, Border Patrol um, and a few state agencies about um, how CBP will notify certain groups of people if there are sacred sites um, in, in federal lands. Um, the New Mexico State Land Office did not sign on to this programmatic agreement. Um, inside of that agreement, it did have a lot of surveillance talk in there that, you know, this was a, this programmatic agreement uh, acknowledges that CBP will continue to do surveillance and, and border protection, um, which we already know um, means harming, incarcerating, and terrorizing families and people who are at the border. Um, and that's a really huge concern about how um, surveillance, mass surveillance on the part of the government is being used um, to commit human rights violations. Um, and to destroy um, sacred sites that many indigenous people in that area um, need in order for their culture um, to continue. Yeah, um, we also saw a recent example of that comes from these like collaborations of different um, agencies at, with law enforcement of how nonprofits can be monitored even if we aren't doing something wrong. Um, so this example actually came from the Blue Leaks um, hack, um, which included information from some fusion centers, which are places where federal law enforcement agencies work with local police. Uh, and so something that ended up in a fusion center terrorism report is this letter from someone who volunteers with the Black Lives Matter organization in her area and she wrote to a law firm asking if they'd be interested in providing pro bono services to people who were arrested at protests. And the law firm that she wrote to happened to think that people deserve to be arrested at protests because they are terrorists in this person's opinion. And so printed out the, the email asking if they'd be willing to serve as a pro bono lawyer and mailed it anonymously to um, the law enforcement office. Um, accusing them of being terrorists. Uh, and the, whoever was receiving this letter was like, oh, okay. Uh, so they logged into the um, Regional Intelligence Center and created a suspicious activity report for this, you know, student who had written in asking about pro bono legal representation. Uh, and now that person is in this database as a potential terrorist just because um, of kind of a random series of events that just happened to go wrong. So um, even if we don't think the work that we're doing is particularly radical or out there, you never know when someone else might think it is and want to make a big deal about it. Um, so we can't go into all of the different kinds of surveillance. Uh, there are so many um, DNA and facial recognition and license plate readers and cameras and beyond. Um, but you can actually look up what surveillance is being used near you. Um, so we wanted to give folks a minute or two to navigate to the access Atlas of Surveillance um, and see if there's anything in your area that surprises you um, about the surveillance technology that's in use. Like I had mentioned, I'm in New Mexico, and so when I um, was looking up the Atlas of Surveillance, um, 
uh, to see what was happening in New Mexico, it was really jarring um, to see, like, there are a lot of orgs, um, you know, who don't want to see more violence against um, Black people and, and protesters. Um, but those body cams, you know, um, where where is that data being stored to? And we know that there are instances of law enforcement waiting until after um, an action, a direct action happens um, for them to like go back through the footage and prosecute or arrest someone um, and potentially have them prosecuted um, because of those body cams. If there's anything that seems interesting to you, feel free to share in the chat. Yeah, please do. Um, I'm in Austin, Texas, and we have one of these fusion centers um, that create these like terrorism watch alerts, um, which I didn't realize until I checked on this tool. Yeah, we did have a, a question. Um, would we either want facial recognition to be more accurate at identifying black and brown faces, given that technologies are inherently personal? Myself, I am working, I'm learning more and more about abolition and it's something that I very much believe in. Um, and I, my, my personal answer is no. Um, and it's really complicated. Uh, you know, what else are we going to use AI for? Like how, how else is, what are other uses that aren't carceral or aren't punitive? And I don't have an answer for that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think that these technologies, when used for purposes of, of advancing the interests of the carceral state and the surveillance state are harmful, whether they're harmful in some ways when they're not accurate and they're harmful in other ways when they are accurate. So I agree, I would, as a, like me personally, would support, you know, not having police departments use facial recognition regardless of how accurate they are. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but that's a great question and something that provokes a lot of debate. Um, so definitely like following the Electronic Frontier Foundation is a great way to kind of learn more and, and stay up to date on, on people's thoughts. Um, another great resource is Surveillance Capitalism, which is a book by um, Shoshana Zuboff. Um, so it's not just um, police departments or law enforcement or the state that are surveilling us, it's also um, companies like we mentioned, everything that we're doing on the internet, there's records created of it. And that data is actually how companies like Facebook make money. Like everything that we do on Facebook is then packaged and sold to advertisers. And you know, the, our, like what we're doing in our leisure time online is creating billions of dollars um, for people who own those companies. Um, and this is an example of how that can play out by um, Kashmir Hill, who's a phenomenal um, journalist who writes on tech and privacy issues. Um, Target figured out that a teen was pregnant before her father did because of searches she was making online um, and cookies that were installed and scripts that were tracking her from site to site. And she actually ended up getting, I believe she got mailed, um, you know, coupons related to pregnancy that her father saw and was like very confused about um, because of what she was doing online. So it's really invasive to privacy um, when there is something that you're trying to keep confidential. Yeah, and one of the things I had brought up to Amanda as we were preparing is that especially for indigenous people, you know, we face higher rates of sexual assault um, disproportionate to other races. And, you know, if we're trying to keep ourselves safe and um, look for things to help us stay safe, um, something like this could even, could put us in more danger um, if it gets out somehow, whether it's through a mailer or a coupon um, or ads that keep coming up on, on our Facebook feed if someone is, is um, monitoring our, our phone use, um, uh, the things that, that come up and could, could potentially put someone in more danger. Uh, so all this leads to the question of what can we do? Um, we, you, once you start searching for digital security stuff, there is so much information and it can quickly become very overwhelming. So we're going to talk briefly about threat modeling, which is the idea of focusing on minimizing risks 
that are specific to you. So um, there's a ton of best practices out there and it's okay to just focus on the ones that seem most important to you. And how you'll decide that is the context of what you're doing. So the best practices for you are really gonna depend on what you're doing. Um, you know, in our movement, we have, you know, pregnant people seeking to manage an abortion outside of a medical setting. We have people who work for abortion clinics. We have storytellers. We have people going to protests. Um, for each of these people, the best practices are going to be a little bit different. And context about your identity is also super important. As we mentioned, these technologies tend to uh, impact already oppressed people the most. So things like your immigration status, your race, um, your ethnicity or your culture are all going to affect um, your threat model. So these are some risks. Uh, we like to create these axes of risks um, based on likelihood and severity. And this is going to look different depending on those different contexts. So biased algorithms falsely identifying you or your organization as a threat, um, for me as a cisgender white person, a lot less likely to happen and probably like and less severe because uh, I will probably fare better um, dealing with law enforcement. Um, and same with all of these different points on this axis of risk, those different aspects of our identity are going to affect whether or not they're severe and whether or not they're likely. Um, and another thing to kind of interrogate as we're thinking about this is does the organization you work for contribute to surveillance? Um, people will bring their experiences with surveillance to their interactions with your organization. Um, and I realized that nonprofits really are complicit in this at the last place I worked where my boss wanted to do direct mailing and so was buying lists from other nonprofits. And I was like, I don't, I never thought that when I donated to an organization, they could sell my information to another organization. And so that really like was surprising to me um, and made me kind of think twice <laughs> about organizations that were selling their lists. Um, I also found out that, um, and I love Airtable. I, my organization swears by it and their staff are so helpful at making sure we understand, you know, because we um, invest in it, making sure we understand like what all of the features are, especially considering the work that we do where we might handle very personal um, medical information or ident identifying information. Um, uh, some platforms will require um, to, you to be HIPAA compliant, which I really appreciate. So I think that is just like a tip that I found out, like Airtable, um, you know, if you're looking to hold certain kinds of medical information, um, you have to go through a certain process with them to, um, to protect them and protect yourself and also your, your clients or your patients um, when you're handling really sensitive data. Yeah. Another place I've, I've seen this come up is when you're calling people for get out the vote kind of stuff. And a lot of people are really weirded out about how you got their number. Um, and so being able to explain that um, can be helpful <laughs> in decreepifying yourself <laughs> when you're doing those calls. Um, but that's one way that people's negative experience with like spam calls can end up affecting your nonprofit. Um, and when you're really quick to touch on what you just said around, you know, like, especially now because we're in election, we're in an election cycle, um, we're getting a lot of texts um, from candidates or from organizations. Um, if any of you are using Vote Builder or the van, please update it as much as possible. Um, I'm starting to realize like when you get the wrong number and it's just coming up as like a, a, a number you don't have saved in your phone that could also potentially put someone's safety at risk um, when you don't keep up to date records or databases on people. And you're trying to get, you know, black, indigenous, people of color and low income folks out to vote. Yeah, great point. Um, so keeping your databases up to date, interrogating how you're contributing surveillance are a couple of the things that we can do. Another thing that we can do is encryption, which is also part of that like HIPAA compliance and secure database storage that Rachel was mentioning. Um, so you, encryption has been a buzzword lately with all this stuff happening with Zoom, uh, but what actually is it? 
Um, basically, it's a way of scrambling messages with keys so that only the intended recipient can read the message. So in this example, Bob is writing to Alice. Um, he has a key that encrypts the message so that the server, which is like the, all those computers that your message is going through on your way from you know, Bob's computer to Alice's computer, the servers can't read the message because it's scrambled. And only Alice has the key to unlock it and read it. Um, so this protects you from a lot of those people along the way that were trying to read your messages or access your information. Um, only the people with encryption keys can see your information. So again, as we think about this path that our information takes, um, only people who can decrypt it can see it. And that's how encryption protects you. Um, so there's two main different kinds of encryption. Um, there's end-to-end -end encryption, which is, has also become a bit of a buzzword. Um, it's also known as zero knowledge, and that's when you own the keys. So the company can't see your data. So that systems administrator who is looking at the Wi-Fi or working at the internet service provider or working for Google can't see your information because you own the keys. Um, and some examples of this are Signal, Trezorit, and ProtonMail. Um, there's also in transit and at rest encryption, and that's when the company that's providing the service owns the keys. So the company can see it if they want to. Um, so for example, if you call them with a customer service request and they have to look at your information, they can decrypt it, um, or if they're asked to. So if they get a subpoena um, or a request from a law enforcement agency. So examples of that kind of encryption are Snapchat, Gmail, um, Almost every service on the internet at this point is going to be in transit or at rest encryption um, if it's something, you know, reputable. So again, some other, some to kind of try, drive the point home, um, Slack, Snapchat, Gmail, these are all encrypted in transit and at rest. So that means when it's like on their storage servers, it's encrypted. So it's mainly protected from hackers and unauthorized people. So if someone tried to hack Slack and get into their servers, they would just get a bunch of encrypted information, unless the encryption keys are also stored on those servers, <laughs> uh, which has happened and is how a lot of password breaches happen. Um, but it's in theory protected with a certain level of encryption, um, but the company is the one in charge of that. End-to-end um, -end encryption is that zero knowledge idea. So the provider is having you establish keys when you set up your account, uh, and then they can't access any of your information. So with ProtonMail, they're an encrypted email provider. Um, you sign up with a username and password, and the password is your encryption key. So if you forget your password for your ProtonMail account, there's nothing you can do. You can't access all your information. It's scrambled, but it, it, you're protected because ProtonMail doesn't store a copy of your password. It's your key, and only you have it. Um, Signal is a end-to-end -end encrypted messaging app, um, which has become super popular, which we're thrilled about. Um, it also is open source. Both of them are open source. And open source means that anyone can look up the code. And you know, people who are coders or software engineers can actually verify how these systems work. Um, they both also care about privacy, so they don't log metadata. Signal has a disappearing message feature. And with Signal, you sign up with your phone number and the encryption key is generated and stored on your phone. So you don't have a password or anything to remember. They use um, like technology on your phone so that only your phone can decrypt that message um, and only the phone of the person you're sending it to can, can read it. Um, there are a couple other end-to-end -end encrypted messaging options that you may have heard are end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, WhatsApp and iMessage are both end-to-end -end encrypted. But the encryption alone isn't the only thing to consider when you're thinking about how to be the most private when you're using these communication technologies. Other things to think about are the metadata. Um, so with WhatsApp and with iMessage, both of them collect a lot more metadata. They collect information about who you're messaging, when you're online, like WhatsApp will keep track of the last time you were logged in, how many messages you're sent, what groups you're in, um, all of that metadata that can really put together a lot of what you're doing, even though they don't have the content of the messages. They also will both encourage you to back up your messages to the cloud. And the cloud backups are not encrypted. Um, so that's one reason why 
if I'm talking to someone about something that I really want to be encrypted, I'm going to choose Signal because I know that no matter what the person I'm sending the message to, um, if they like can't, um, even if they, they don't have the option to turn on chat backups, like someone I'm messaging on Signal, that message is going to be encrypted no matter what. Whereas if I'm messaging someone on WhatsApp, they might have chat backups on and then my chats are going to end up in their backup and that's accessible to, um, to Facebook and to law enforcement. Um, your internet traffic can also be encrypted. So you can encrypt all the things. Um, you encrypt your internet traffic uh, when this HTTPS symbol is there. A lot of browsers now have the lock icon um, and you can install this application or this browser extension called HTTPS Everywhere, which is made by the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, and they will force the site to be secure if the people who built that site have enabled that option. Um, so this is another thing to double check that your organization has. You wanna make sure that your website has your SSL certificate correctly installed. And that's the thing that verifies you are who you say you are and that turns on the encryption um, for your website. Uh, okay, if you wanna go next level with encrypting your internet traffic, so you can't control whether or not a website is HTTPS encrypted. Um, the person who sets it up has to turn it on. So if you wanna make sure that your internet traffic is encrypted no matter what, you can use something called a virtual private network or VPN. Um, so VPNs encrypt your data, kind of like this graphic is showing, it like puts in a little tunnel of encryption. Uh, so it goes from you to the VPN to the website and it's encrypted the whole way. So even if you're not, um, visiting a website that has encryption, it encrypts your information anyway. Um, but when you're using a VPN, you're basically transferring your trust from your internet service provider to the VPN. So instead of it going through, instead of your like requests going through a bunch of computers owned by your internet service provider, it goes through a bunch of computers owned by your VPN. And there are VPNs that exist um, that are free that will log all of your data, just like your internet service provider does. And so it's important to choose a VPN that is either open source or audited or otherwise has proof that they don't log your information. Um, so. I can also share a document um, that I created um, in collaboration with the um, Citizen Clinic, um, some amazing students out of UC Berkeley. Um, uh, that has a table for folks, if you are interested, has a table um, of the various VPNs that I researched and the free ones. Um, my organization pays for Tunnel Bear um, and it covers five devices, I believe, per user. Um, so yeah, little sidebar. I'm happy to send that to folks. Yeah, Tunnel Bear is awesome. They have like a full audit and they also provide free VPN accounts for human rights defenders in countries where the internet is censored. So that's really cool. Um, I use private internet access. Other people love Proton VPN, which is the same people that do um, Proton Mail. Um, so yeah, this, this is just one of those things where you want to do your research before you put all of your trust and data in that company. Um, you can also encrypt your devices. So iPhones and newer Androids are encrypted by default, which is very cool um, with a passcode. Of course, that means that a strong passcode is important. So the benefit of having a phone or you know a computer that's encrypted is that if even if it's lost or stolen unless someone can guess your passcode they can't get any of your data off of it um, if your computer is not encrypted even if you have a password set up on it someone can pull the hard drive out and access your information by plugging that into another machine whereas if it's encrypted everything is scrambled so it can really reduce the some of the stress of losing or having a device stolen because you know that at least none of the information can be accessed. Um, or when you're crossing a border um, and you think your device might be confiscated, um, you wanna make sure that you have encryption turned on. But remember, um, encryption is not a silver bullet. It alone does not make you secure. Uh, I love this comic of when you reuse your MySpace password on your ProtonMail account. <laughs> And the FBI and the NSA are like, you know, I can't believe your bad security practices. Um, 
you have to make sure that these accounts are protected with strong passwords, um, just like any other account. Um, otherwise, the fact that it's encrypted, you know, doesn't really do that much um, if someone can decrypt it by guessing your key. Um, along those lines, it's also important to recognize that encryption does not guarantee safety. So encryption is very secure. Um, it will secure your data. It will make sure that you know, an unauthorized hacker can't get your data. So I know that Signal is very secure because it, um, it, the information can't be decrypted, but it might not necessarily be safe. If I'm texting someone who is an abuser who's going to screenshot my text, it doesn't matter that they're encrypted, that's still not safe. Um, so safety depends on trust and respect and healthy relationships um, and encryption can't guarantee that. Regardless, encryption is love. This is another great person to follow on Instagram or Twitter, Cyberdoula. Um, they coined the phrase encryption is love, which I love because it is. Um, it's taking care of your community and your information and keeping it safe. So we also just wanted to throw in a quick plug. Rachel and I are both very um, passionate about protecting end-to-end -end encryption. Um, and there's currently two bills um, in Congress that um, put encryption at risk, um, the Earn It Act and the Lawful Access to Encrypted Data Act. Um, keep an eye on these. Um, the Earn It Act is particularly insidious because it's claiming to help end child sexual exploitation online, but doesn't actually have any measures to help protect children from abuse. Instead, what it does is give the Attorney General Barr the power to make requirements that tug companies have to follow in order to keep Section 230 protection, which is the protection that um, internet, you know, that websites have that means that they aren't responsible for the speech of people who post on them. Um, he's vocally been anti-encryption. Um, it's a little complicated, but we're happy to talk more about it. If you're interested, you can feel free to follow up with us and also recommend that you follow the EFF, um, Hacking Hustling, which is a group of sex workers who have been doing a lot of advocacy around internet freedom um, and Access Now, which does a lot of international work around internet freedom. We owe so much to, to sex workers for organizing um, um, because the internet is what they use as their platform to like keep, e keep each other and their community safe um, and be able to do their work. And a lot of the laws and, and rules that we have around privacy and encryption. Um, and as far as it's come, uh, many, it's much in part to, to, um, to sex workers. Yes. Great. So I think we only have about five minutes left, but we wanted to open the chat and the Q and A to what experiences you have, what questions you have, um, and yeah, feel free to share in the chat in the Q and A. I can't see the Q and A, but I know Rachel has an eye on it. Um, yeah, someone asked if um, if you might send the PowerPoint. I would love to share the slides. Uh, I couldn't find in any of the material for presenters how to do that. Um, so I will follow up with the folks, the team at Netroots, um, just to see if there's a way to do that. Uh, because hey, well, I your Netroots volunteer hopping in here. Uh, if you uh, reach out to me after this, uh, anybody who has liked this panel, uh, you know, in the Netroots app, uh, we can get a list of people's contact that way and send any follow-up emails to uh, or information to folks who've liked the event. So if y'all can go ahead and do that in the app, if you're interested in receiving those things, we will make sure they get to you. Awesome. We promise we will not store your emails and sell them. <laughs> yes. Um, ooh, Gail said, what I search on my desktop shows up on my phone. Um, yeah, if you're, um, connect, if you're logged into Google on both devices, then Google will kind of sync your search history to both of those devices. Um, so that, that could be what's happening there. Uh, if you're signed into a Google account on both devices. 
Um, the name of the person to contact uh, for the slides, I think you just have to like the session in Socio and then Rachel and I will get in touch with the room host um, to get your contact info. Does anyone else have like a question or an observation in the last minute and a half, two minutes? I'll jump ahead to some of our resources so you can yeah. see what you'll get when you get the slide deck. Um, we just kind of put down our favorite people to follow, to learn more. Um, we've, yeah, we've learned everything we know about this outside of like traditional academic settings. So you can too. Um, if you, there's great resources for your nonprofit. Um, there's an upcoming free course from Tech Impact for accidental techies, uh, which is very exciting. And lots of great resources about feminist cybersecurity and, and DIY cybersecurity that I learned a lot from. Um, oh, so many protesting resources, Spanish resources, <laughs> and our contact info. Yeah, please email us. Yes. Yeah, thank you all again for your attention and your great questions and your interest in this topic. So excited. One of the things I absolutely hate about like tech things many of the times is like, it's hard for me to understand because I'm not like immersed in that world. And so that's like one of the things that really got me interested in it was that um, DDF and Ele Electronic Frontier Foundation just like make it really easy to understand. Um, so yeah, anyone can do it, I promise. Thank you all. All right, we're at 250. Yeah, thank you all again. And um, we'll get you these slides with our contact info so we can continue the conversation that way. Bye. Okay, I stopped the live stream, so. Yes, we should. Yeah. Okay. This was well, great. Waiting. I yeah. know. I'm so excited. This was amazing. Um, let me just check with the host for what their email is. Uh, hey, I'm here. Oh, you're here. Okay. Yeah. Um, what is your email or who should we email about the, the list for following up with folks? Uh, let's see. Uh, you can, I'm just going to type my email into chat for y'all. One second. Oh, great. Thank you. And thank you again. I know y'all are hustling so hard behind the scenes to like make this all happen. Yeah, no, of course. Sorry about the having my mic unmuted there for a minute. No problem. Um, I've, uh, yeah, so that my email just got sent to you there. Anybody who adds this session. Oh, someone is, it's still on live to people. Oh, well. Hello, folks. If you guys add this session to your uh, socio, like add it to among the ones that you uh, just want to attend, even though it's already over. Uh, that is how we will uh, be able to get access to your information or your contact information in order to send you those slides. So you guys can go ahead and do that. Awesome. Great. Thank you again. And I guess, I guess we'll sign off to... Yeah, you're the one uh, running the thing. So as soon as you exited, Amanda, it'll end for the rest of us. Okay. Right. Bye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>